that we have a principle of shlich shalom kamosov. We have a principle that if a person appoints an agent to do something on his behalf, the action of the agent is attributed to the one who appointed him to be the agent. That's the principle of shlich shalom kamosov. The agent of a person is the equivalent of himself. So therefore, if you appoint a person to be Makadosh in the Isha, to marry a woman on your behalf, although the Torah says, Kikach Ish Isha, the person who takes the woman, so it seems the husband must do the act of marriage, Kedushin, that the Kedushin, and must give it to the woman. So without the Xeris HaKosov of Shlichus, what would you would say? The person himself has to be the one involved in the act of marriage. Appointing an agent is not sufficient. The Torah introduces the concept of shlichus. Shlich shalom kamosa, if you appoint an agent to act on your behalf in the context of marriage, so then the haloch is, it's as if you married the woman. What about if the woman herself, it's as ki isha, the woman must receive the money, must receive the object of value. Let's say she appoints an agent to represent her, right? And the Torah doesn't introduce the concept of shlichus, so it's not a marriage. Because the Torah says the husband must give the, the object of value to the woman. It must be in her possession, in her hand. So if you did not, it's not valid. The Torah introduces no, that if she appoints a shliach, an agent to represent her, the shliach is kamoso. The agent is equivalent of her. So the agent is equivalent of him, and the agent is equivalent of her. The marriage is a valid marriage. Okay? The shlich is her. She is the, the shlich is her. The shlich shal, shlich shal adam kemoso. The shlich is the equivalent of himself, or kemoso is the equivalent of herself. So this is true by get, and we'll see in a moment. No, no. Yes, a woman, a man, it could be whatever it is. Shlich it has to be a Jew. Shlich has to be a Jew, a non-Jew, a shlich slachum. A non-Jew cannot appoint an agent meaning a Naju who appoints an agent in his position, in his place, the agent is not himself. If a Jew appoints an agent, it's not valid. You know, it's a shaila, it's a shaila, it's a question. There's a discussion in Bechorus that if a non-Jew appoints a non-Jew on his behalf, is the non-Jew considered his agent. But a Jew appointing a non-Jew, definitely. There's a famous Rashi we discussed in Shabbos where we have a principle of Amir um, al-Akum Shvus, that if you instruct the non to act on your behalf on Shabbos, although, and he violates Shabbos, rabbinically you're not permitted. Amir al saying to the non to violate Ishwas, rabbinically, it's a rabbinic prohibition. So Rashi says, why? What's the reason? Because factually, we have a principle of shlichus. We have a principle of shlichus. So normally you appoint an agent, the agent's yourself, so you know what's going to happen. So if the non the guy is acting on your behalf, and he's your agent, Although it doesn't have the laws of agency, so you say, well, he does it like I'm doing it. So ultimately, you know what's going to happen eventually. So if you don't have the agent to act on your behalf, you'll do it yourself. Because the person in his mind will rationalize, say, well, he is me. So if he is me and I, I'm permitted to do this through the goy, so, it's, so how far, what, what's the difference if I do it myself? Therefore, rabbinically, they say, Amir Lakam Shus. Rabbinically, you're not, you're not, for that reason, you're not permitted to instruct a non-Jew to act on your behalf. Because ain't shlichus la'akum. First, ain't shlichus. Secondly, ain't shlichus varavera. I mean, we'll, we'll discuss this later. There are many reasons. First, a non-Jew cannot be your agent. So this, he's not you. But it's irrelevant what he is, but there's a fence. It's a rabbinic fence. But how is it perceived by the one who has the non-Jew acting on his behalf? That's the way it's perceived in his own mind. Okay. So this is the principle of shlichus. So the Gemara asks, shlichus minolon. So the principle is a Torah principle. Where is it sourced? The Tanya. It says regarding a gift, a man divorces his wife. Vishilach. You know, when the Torah says, the Torah could have said, Vigiresh, right? Vigiresh means he divorces. It says he sends her away. Why does Torah use the term Vishilach? Rather than the Giresh. The Shil Mlamet Shuosa Shliach. The reason why the Torah uses the term Shilach sending, it's to connote 
that he could bring this about through agency, through a shliach. Vishil Chof is a Torah. The Pesach says Vishil Chof. He sends her away. Vishil Chof. Melamed she is a shliach. She's able to make a shliach. Now let's understand something. We find throughout the Torah, except for Mitzvah Sessions, Mang Rama, we don't differentiate between a man and a woman. Correct? So if we say, if the Torah already reveals to me that the man can make a shliach, what do I need an extra hay to tell me she can make a shliach? It's understood. If we normally don't differentiate between a man and a woman in terms of what the status is, unless the Torah makes the differentiation, so that it should be sufficient. Vishilach. Torah should written Vishilach. What does Torah say? Vishilchot. The Torah writes the additional hay to tell him not only could he make the shliach, she could, she's able to make the shliach. What do I need the extra hay? If there's no basis to differentiate between the, the man and the woman, uh, establishing the principle regarding the man that he can make, he's able to make a shliach. It's understood the woman can make a shliach. But yet Torah goes out of its way to add a hay, Vishilchot, he also shliach. Shliach. She's also able to make a shliach. David, you had a question. We'll see. It's not so simple. That's something else. That's not based on this. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. I'm just bringing up the question. Evidently, there's reason to differentiate. We'll see. Well, the Gemara is going to say the three sources. The three sources that we know Shlish Rav Kamoso. Right. And the Gemara is going to ask, what do we need three? S establish the principle okay. and apply it all. So the Gemara is going to explain this in Amit Beis. V'nosel o Sefer Krisos. But it says V'shilcho. It says Ki Kachishisho. We'll see in a moment. I'm just bringing this up just to appreciate what the Gemara is going to answer. So we have Vishilach Shuosa Shliach Vishilcho Mlami Shiosa Shliach. Then it says Vishilach Vishilcho. It says it twice. It says in the parish of Get, it says Vishilcho again. It says Vishilcho once, Vishilcho a second time. Because Vyotz Voice Lishacher, right? She goes to another man. And also, the, the second marriage doesn't mar work out. So it's either he divorces her or he dies. Right? It says, why did the first one divorce her? He saw a certain inappropriateness in her behavior. So if that's the case, how does the second man marry her? Simply, right? He just got rid of her because she's a bad woman. What are you marrying a bad woman? So it says, so what happens? What's the Torah telling you? Either you're going to divorce her, or he's, she's going to bury you, one or the other. Right? One, one or the other. That's what the Torah is saying. That's the second shilcha. The second shilcha is written by the second husband. Melamit shashlichos is shliach. That a shliach, he's able to make a shliach, which is not so simple. Right? Of course, the only reason why a person is able to make a shliach, of course, the shliach is representing him, but if the shliach was only representing someone else, how do we know he can make another shliach to take it another step. We learned that from the second shilcha. So Mar says, Ashkan begerishin. Because you, it's not you're not the one who's actually generating it. Where does it come from? Your power, your ability. What? It, where is it rooted? Is it rooted in yourself? or It's rooted in someone else. No, 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 no. A person makes a shliach to do something. Not a shlich wants to appoint somebody to take his place. Definitely. You don't, well, if, if it's generally understood you do, then you don't. Because the man says, I only want you and no one else. You're, only re you're representing me in this context. I don't want anybody else to represent me. No, which means even if I authorize you to make another shliach, 
But maybe I'd say he can't make another shliach. In what context? Not when the original person is opposed to it. What, where does your power lie? Your power lies because you represent me. I only want you to represent me, represent me in this context. Not another. How, why could you appoint another shliach? Because you're representing me. That means the third party, who's, who's he going to represent? When the shliach appoints the shliach, now the second shliach, who is he? The original person. Man says, I don't want that second person to represent me. So how could you appoint somebody to represent me where I'm opposed to it? So the answer, he's agree, he's agreement to it. He's agreeable that the other person should also represent him. But nevertheless, the first person, I appointed him. So that's my power. But who says you have the ability to choose another one, even with permission? Factually, it's not the original po person appointing him. You're the appointing him. Nevertheless, we learn from the second Shilach, Shilchor, that he can. That's what the Torah is telling us. Okay, let's see. So the Torah where it says, Vishilchor, Vishilach, Vishilchor. That's written in regard to Gershin. The Kedushim in Nolan. But how do we know in regard to Kedushin? Because the Mishnah speaks about a person could be Makarish through a Shliach, right? Ubishlucho, right? How do we know by Kedushin? Ish Makarish bo Ubishlucho, and she is Bishlucho. Vchi tema do you all of me Gershin? We have the principle of Mamatzino. Torah sets the principle in one location, and I draw it to everyone else. Where else? Where says no. Mala Gershin Shken Yeshna Bal Korcho. Right? Gershin is one of the exceptions. The Torah says a man could divorce his wife even against her will. As long as he puts it in her hand, or what's the equivalent of a hand, she's divorced. Yodo Gagov Chatzero Vekarfifa. Right? Her domain. You put it in her domain, she's divorced, whether she likes it or not. So it's a Chidush. So you see, the husband's able to terminate the marriage even though she actually didn't acquire it. So we see that he has such power in this area, which is unusual, maybe that's why the Torah allows him to delegate it through an agent. Because the Torah gives him full control, full domination. But maybe in other areas where Kedushan's only, if she agrees, if she's not agreeable, he can't marry her. It's like any other entering into any other acquisition or transfer or establishing a status. Both parties have to be in agreement. What's the court chart? What's the court? That is her. That is her. That is her hand. That is the equivalent of her hand. No, because that's her issue. That's chotzer. No, but the Torah. Again, again. I give it to John Doe again. John Doe happens to be a Jew. Okay. John Doe's a Jew, but he's not the agent. Now, how the Torah says she must receive the get. It must be in her hand. Her domain is equivalent of her hand. When you give to John Doe, and, the husband, and it says the husband must give it, the husband must put it in her hand. John, is John Doe the husband? He's not the husband. If, he, if he's not a shlich, he's not the husband. Yeah, but if the Torah never introduced the concept of shlichus. So the answer is, it is. He made it, what about her? The, he, he, sh he gives it to John Doe on her behalf. So he, Torah says you must give her the get. Where did you give it to her? When you put it in a courtyard or a hand, that's the equivalent of the same thing. The Gemara learns from a pasuk that her courtyard is the equivalent of her hand. Okay, so you put it in her hand. So you met the criteria of what a get is. But if the third party, if she's not able to make a shliach, giving the third party, you didn't put it in her hand. So how was she divorced? that she makes. She has to appoint the shliach. Right? She must appoint somebody to represent her. She doesn't appoint somebody to represent her. She's not divorced because the get is not being put in her hand. You follow me? Let's get back to it. You, you forgot what's bothering you. That's why. <laughs> what's the question? Because the... Wait a second, but it forced to get put, but you must put it in her hand. No what about he throws it up in the air? He throws it in the fire. Says, 
You're divorced. Is she divorced when he throws it into the fire? Her, where she's staying, because that's her courtyard. So that, her courtyard is her. That is her. That's her head. What about she's not here? She's, she's in Europe, and the husband wants a divorce here in the United States. So she appoints somebody to represent her in the United States. This, she, the agent is equivalent to first. So when the husband gives the get to her agent, regardless of where she is, as long as she's alive, she's divorced. Right? Simple. So if we only have Gershin, because I say she came Yishna Bal Korcho, Omakro, Vyotsa Right? So she leaves one voice lishacher. What's what's vahoiso? Hoiso is what? It's kedushin. That's makish havayli yitzio. Ma yitzio mashri shaliach. Just as in regard to divorce, the Torah empowers him to appoint a shaliach. Afavayu nami mashri shaliach. In regard to marriage, the Torah also empowers him to create the shaliach on both sides. Okay. We learned the Gemara asked early in the first parak, if you remember, Isha Niknis Kesa Shtar Chazo at Bio. How do you know Shtar? Gemara asked, how do you know with a document? It's the same. This 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 this, this is the source. Just as Torah says, how do you the cost of Los Sefer Krisos? It's a document. So therefore, as she's she's divorced with a document, she's married with a document. Same Hekish. Torah associates one with the other, juxtaposes one to the other. No, no, wait, wait, wait. That doesn't, no, it's the other, the other way. The postage that it says that he's able to push is, is, is in the context of divorce. Vishilach, he sends her off. So, of course, Torah says, Vahoyso. The Torah is, is, is juxtaposing marriage to divorce. So, just as in regard to divorce, he, he could point to Shlich and she could, identically in regard to, to marriage. She and he. Maybe yes. The Gemara is going to discuss that now. So maybe the 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 example of get in kedushin that is the source for every other shlichus. The Gemara is going to ask the question, but we have two other sources. You mean for a kedushin? Yes. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. As in regard to get, he and she both can appoint. Okay. In regard to kedushin, he and she both can appoint. So Gemara says, "Hello, hot itnan." Ha'omel shlucho, say shrom. Person appoints a shliach. Person has tevel, untied grain, produce. Now the Torah says the only the owner of the grain is qualified to tithe the grain, to take truma, meiser, and whatever has to be taken. He appoints a shliach that the shliach should act on his behalf to do the hafrosha, to tithe it. But we don't know that yet. Right now, all shlichos he has to be Jewish. There's no such thing as, if we say, a non-Jew cannot represent you. Okay. David, I'm, I'm impressed. Okay. Homer l'shlucho. Say, Trom. Person says to his agent, go and tithe on my behalf. Torim kedas balabayus. Now, the law is on the Torah level. We say, chita achas pateras you can have tons and tons of wheat, of grain. You take one kernel and say, this kernel should be truma for, for the tons of grain. It's a valid hafrosha. It's a valid tithing. All the grain now is considered tithe from truma. Meiser, you have to take 10%. But truma, on a Torah level, there's no, there's no even the most minuscule amount is considered valid. That's valid tithing. Rabbinically, Chazal say, it's nasmachto. A generous tithing is one fortieth of the quantity. One fiftieth is is considered benoni. That's benonis. And ein ro, a person who's stingy, is one sixtieth. Okay, we learned the Mishnah, right? Okay, good. Howard also learned it. Give him credit. Okay, so one sixtieth is ein ro. So let's say the person appoints the shliach, and the shliach knows exactly the mindset of this person who's appointing him, whether he's generous, whether he's the average, or he's, he's actually stingy. 
So if he knows exactly what he wants he should do, so he, he, he tithes the percentage of what he understands the Balabais would want. The one who pointed it. Vim Enu Yodea Das Balabais. He's not sure exactly what the Balabais wants. He, he knows it when he wants it to be tithed. Torim Bebeinus. What he should, when he tithes it, he should take the average as the average person would be, which is one fiftieth. Echud Mi Chamishim, which is one fiftieth. What about Piches Asoro, Josef Asoro? Let's say he took ten less or ten more. Right? He did more or less. Truma so truma. It's valid. Although, we'll see Tosis in a moment. Although, after his Balbai says, look, I'm a stingy guy. I'm a miser. Doesn't make a difference what he says. It's still valid. It says truma so truma. It may be good there. So now the question is, well, we have a, a Mishnah that it says that although the Torah says the person himself should do the tithing, but if you point to Shliach, the Shliach is qualified to tithe this, he's qualified to tithe. So Moses says, Nolan, how do we know this? Maybe we'll learn it, we'll draw this from, from divorce, divorce and marriage. Maybe not. Gershin, or even Kedushin, it's considered a mundane act, an ordinary act. Kedu Trum is what? That's Kedusha? We'll discuss it, right? But tr Truma, what are you creating? You're creating an object of Kedusha? Even though Kedusha, a woman's called, it's called Kedusha, means something else, means she's off limits to the world, right? We had Tosis in the first parak. But Kedusha, there's, there's no holiness. With the whole Kedusha doesn't mean holiness. It means off limits. We'll see. Let's stay on the page before we get to Chulin. Well, it says Chulin. It's Chulin. Right? Because marriage and divorce is Chulin. It's Chul. Truma is, is, is Kodesh. Omakro Atem Gamatem. It says Atem. But it says Gamatem. The Torah says when the Levi receives the Miser, what does he have to do? He has to take Truma's Miser. Right? He has to take a tenth of the tenth to give to the to the Kohen. The Yisrael takes Truma, then he takes Miser. Ten percent is given to the Levi. So there it says, the Levi, Gamatem. You must take Miser mina Miser. You have, you have to take ten percent of what you received. And what is that? That's Truma, and you give that to the Kohen. The Torah says, it could have said, Atem. What's Gamatem? The Gam is what? It's superfluous. The Rabbis is a Shaliach. It means also you. The also means not only you, but somebody representing you. Now, how does he represent you? He represents you because you appointed to be your shliach, to be your agent. Rabbi says your shliach. It's interesting. When you learn Chomish, you would say that, I, you'd say the gamatem would mean that not only does the Israel have to take, give truma, have to tithe his, his, his wheat, his grain, the levy, when he receives the 10%, but you say it's already been tithed. So you say, Gamatem. Not only the Israel, also you, you must take Truma. Right? But that's not what the, that's not what the Torah is saying. The Torah says, Gamatem does mean, and also you. Although it was tithed, you also must take Truma. Right? If that would be the, the interpretation, Gam. So we have no basis to learn that, the, that you. Because that you, you, the Torah to say that, Atem would be sufficient. What if also you? What, because the surprise is here. Atem, you must take. So what's the gam? So the gam is superfluous. It's speaking about the levy. It's speaking about the levy. That posuk of gam atem is speaking about the levy. I know because it is truma. He's taking truma from, from the miser. It's called truma's miser. No. If the Torah wants to tell me the levy must take truma, the Torah could have said atem. You should take Maser mina maser. Take 10% from, from your 10% you receive, give it to the Kohen. It's speaking about Levi. This is speaking. So the word gam is totally superfluous. So what is, what's, and also, what's the also? Not only could you do it, if you appoint somebody in your place, he's also, he's qualified to do it. Okay? Otherwise, how do we know? Where would you know that from? From Kedushin and, and Kedushin and Gershin, that's Chol. 
you can't learn from Chol to Kodesh. Right? So therefore, it has to say it's regarding something which is Kedusha. So now the Gemara is going to ask, so if by Kodesh, if by Kodesh we're saying you're able to make a Shliach, so definitely by Chol, so let Torah only write it in regard to Shliach, in regard to, to Haprosh's Truma. Torah doesn't have to tell me in regard to Chol, which is, which is Kedusha and Gershon. V'neisi mahanoch, v'neisi hanoch, v'nigmur minei. Let's learn Kedushin and, and Gershin from, from, from the Gamatem, from Truma, Bishum Dikulim Yiprach. Because you're able to differentiate between the two. That there's a certain leniency, although it's Kodesh, but still there's a certain, you're able to bring about Truma more easily than Gershin and Kedushin. Shkin Yeshun Mamachshavah. Normally, you have to verbalize something. But if you don't verbalize something, what's the halacha? It's not valid. Truma, even, because it's v'nechshev lachem trumaschem. That even through the thought process, you're able to bring about the same result. If you think in your mind, I want a certain corner of the harvest should be truma, it's truma. Although he didn't verbalize it. Regarding a shvua, you want to take oath, a neder. Right? This week's parsha, Right? You need what? You need bitus for some. You need articulation of the lips. You have to have verbalization. If you don't, ver you think a shua, you think a neder. It's meaningless. You have to verbalize it. So I'd say maybe you have to verbalize this too to bring about the result. No, v'nechshav lachem trumaschem. That the thought alone, the third thought process alone, brings about the identical result. Can I ask you a question? Let's 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 talk. You verbalize it. I say. I want the northern corner of my harvest to be truma. You just said the words. Nobody's there. Is it truma? You verbalize it. It is. So w w now I think to myself, I want the northern corner of my harvest to be truma. What's the difference? You thought it. What's the difference? You say it or you think it? Because we say normally, dvarm shabalevein dvarm, what you think means nothing. But, but of course, Torah says explicitly, v'nechshav, even what you think is valued as if you said What? Not simple. By Tzlokhe. Tzlokhe is not simple. It's a It's a Rabbeinu Tam in, uh, in Midorim. Now, there's a famous question which, um, which the Shidim Kvetzis asks. The Mar Zeshailo Yesh Yad Lehegdish The Mar is going to say in a moment, what about if you want to consecrate something without verbalizing it? You have an animal which is qualified to be an Ola. Right? To be an Ola, burnt offering. And you don't say, Hare Ze Ola. You don't say, This should be an Ola. You think it should be an Ola. Is it an Ola? What would you say? Ernie, you learned this. Yeah, you better review it, okay? Is it or not? It is. Because the Torah says, the Gemara in, in Shuas quotes a Posuk, it says, Kol Nidiv Lev. In regard to the Mishkan, it says, Nidiv Lev. The one with generosity, God, it says, Kol Nidiv Lev Olos. So you're able to bring about olos with nidiv leiv, just with the heart, without verbalization. So we have two things which come about without verbalization. Hafrosh is truma and consecration of a korban, even if you don't verbalize it. So more has a question in, in the Dorim. Now, it's this week's parsha. The Gemara says, Kiidor ish neder. Kiidor. What's the reiteration neder? If it's Yidor, means a vow. A person makes a vow. So if you make the vow, we know it's Neder. What's Kidor Neder? So from here we learn Yesh Yad Le Nedorim. Yad. We had this in the first parak. Yesh Yad Le Kedushin, Yesh Yad Le Nedorim. Right? That if a person says, what's a Yad? It means a handle. A handle. So if a person, so the Ron explains in Kedushin, in, in the Dorim, if you want to take hold of a cup and you, gra you take the handle, or a, a kadeh or a pot. When you take the handle, you're taking the whole pot because the handle is attached to the cup or to the pot. So if you say make a partial expression, the partial expression is the equivalent of a whole expression. That's called your daim. So normally, although you need art articulation, you need verbalization for neder, do you have to say totally what you mean? Or even a partial statement, as long as it's indicated what you mean, that's sufficient. For instance, if a person would say, 
person says, I'm a nose. So he, he verbalized fully what he means. And somebody stands by and says, Va'ani, an I. If a person would just say, an I, I doesn't mean anything. But within the context of the first person saying, Harini Nazir, he says, an I, although Nazir also needs verbalization, a partial statement which indicates, which reveals what your intent is, is sufficient. Although you need verbalization, that's Yad, because it's Nazir Lahazir. Also, like it says, Neder, Lindo Neder, Nazir Lahazir. By the Torah reiterating it, indicates that even a partial expression is a full expression. Okay, that's, that's Yad. Yad means a handle. So, Mari asks a question Yish la, Yad Lahegdish or ain't Yad Lahegdish? When you consecrate something, you say a partial expression, <coughs> is a partial expression the equivalent of full expression or not? So, the Shidum Kvetz is asking the Dorim, if we're saying, if you say, let's say, a netter has to be verbalized. Nazir has to be verbalized. If you think I, would be, I want to be a Nazir, you think in your mind you want something that should be off limits to you, it means nothing. So therefore, we, the Torah, we need a Chiddush of the Torah that a partial expression is the whole expression. But if in terms of a Korban, if you think the Korban, I want something that should be an Ola. Correct? You think it should be an Ola. That's sufficient with no verbalization whatsoever. So if I say a partial expression, when I said the partial expression, he thought that he thought that he wants it to be the carbon. So he, although we only express it partially, why should it be worse than thinking it? That's the Shidu Kvetsa. So what's the Gemara's question in the Dorim? Yesh yad lahegdish, o ain yad lahegdish, is a partial expression equivalent of a complete expression. Let it be nothing. But when he made the partial expressions, he thought in his mind that he wanted it to be whatever it may be. It is, it's, it's minimally that. That's the Shidu Kvetsa's question. You have a question. So the Shidim Kubetzis answers that let's say a person wants to consecrate something and he has in mind, I only want to consecrate it through words, not through my mindset. I want to fully articulate what it may be. So although when you speak, you think what you're going to say, so when does that when does that consecration come about? Only when you express it. Right? Because something only takes effect based on the the way the person wants it to take effect. So the person's making a partial let's say a person would make a full expression. Although he already thought in his mind, before he said what he said, he thought he wanted to be an Ola, but he says until he says Harezu Ola Hareze Ola, it's not an Ola. So if a person makes a partial expression, so how does he want to express this? How does he want this consecration to come about? The partial expression, correct? So if that's the case, even though he thought Ola, but how does he want this consecration to take place? Through verbalization. But if a partial verbalization in regard to Egdish has no value, so if that's the case, it's not valid. That's the Shidim Kovetz's answer. You have the answer. Very nice answer. So with this, I once wanted to say Pshat, Reb Kivege is a question. Marez Ashayl in Brochus whether a woman could be motzi a man in Birchas HaMozo. Marez HaShayla. Could a, man, a woman be motzi? Because Marez has a question whether a woman is obligated to Birchas HaMozo. Because we say the only one who could be motzi another person only if you're obligated. So if a woman's not obligated, so she's not able to be motzi. But, but so Rabbi Kivega asks, if you hold Hiro Kedibur, Hiro Kedibur, there's a question whether when you think something, it's the equivalent of Dibur, regard to mitzvahs. You're a Kadibur when you think something, fulfilling a mitzvah. So what are we speaking about? When the woman wants to be motzi, the husband, he, what is it? She, he, she hears the words. So even though we're not going to say Shomea Kone, normally when you listen to something, the listening is the equivalent of actually as if you said it. So even though you only say Shomea Kone only if the person who's being motzi you is obligated, but what do we say? Here a Dibur. As she says the Birch Muslim on his behalf, he's definitely thinking about the words. Just as he has to hear the words, he's minimally thinking the words, because he's hearing the words. So when she says, Baruch, he is Baruch. Ato, he is, he is Ato, and, and every, every other word. So even though she will not be Yotze, he won't be Yotze, because she's Eni Muchui Vidover, because she's not obligated, but based on principle, Hiro Kedibor, when he thinks it, he should be Yotze just with thinking it. That's Rubik Vega's question. He doesn't answer it. He asked this question in Mishnayis. 
So what I wanted to say is what the Shidim Kubetzer says. When you say to a person, a woman, be motzimi birchas hamosim, what is what is the mindset? Shemei akone. Say some be motzimi with kiddush, right? Your kiddush should be the equivalent of my kiddush. But that principle only works if the person is mechuyiv bedover. That's shemei akone. So in what context do I want to be yotze? With shemei akone, not with hero kadibur. So if that's the case, you're not yotze. That's the gemara shaila. If the woman's mukhievis bedover, she's obligated. So we say the principle of what? Arevus should be mostly the man based on Shemei Akone. But if in fact she's not obligated, and I want to be Yotze with hearing what she has to say, that her words should be like my words, not with my thinking of what she says, but her kiddi, her birchas amazon should be my birchas amazon, so that then, then I'm not Yotze. I'm not Yotze unless she's obligated. And therefore, that's the Gemara Shaila. But if actually you would op- in advance say, when you say it, I'm going to think it, I'll be Yotze with the thinking. And in truth, she would be Yotze. According to the opinion, he would be Yotze, opinion of Hiro Kedibur. No, it's, it's, left, it's left unresolved. It's left unresolved in the Gemara. Definitely. Definitely. Not that night. He's, he's tithing the miser, f- taking truma, f- point that as long as he's a Jew. No. Can I ask you a question? You have the miser. The person has a grandfather who's a levy. Levy. And the grandfather's a daughter who married a Yisrael, now has a grandson. Now the now the what the, the levy dies, so who inherits? Now the grandson has the miser. The miser was never tithed. Does the grandson the Israel could he tithe it? Of course he tithes it. What about if I purchase untithed miser from a levy? You purchase untithed miser from a levy. What do you do with it? Are you are you permitted misers don't believe chulin? But if it wasn't tithed yet, it's tevil. No, already was tithed. It was tithed. The levy already received it from, from, from the Yisrael. Right. right? Now the levy, has not, the levy goes and sells it to a Yisrael before he tithes it. Right. Now the Yisrael, before he uses that mice, what does he have to do? He has to tithe it. Yeah. Who's obligated? It's a question. It's a question. It's a question. Question whether she has obligated or not. Okay, uh, yeah. Cotton, yeah. And he knows he's not Yotzi with Shemei right. Kone. No, no, definitely not. Not Yotzi. But if you want to be Yotzi with the, with the Cotton's words, with his Kiddush, then you're not Yotzi. There's no question you're not Yotzi. If you say, I don't want to be Yotze with his words, when he says, I'm going to think the words myself, so according to one opinion, you're Yotze. You are Yotze. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Okay, we'll stop here.